I'm going to put myself at risk by making certain predictions. I'll try to go quickly in the interest of time. My disclosures, the current state of affairs. Well, and I'm going to really talk about uh, uh, transcatheter therapies. We have very limited guideline-directed options for transcatheter therapy of symptomatic MR. We have a class 2B recommendation um, right now for primary degenerative MR. Um, not very impressive right now in terms of guidelines. But mitroclip certainly is a beginning, and now with the data in secondary MR, with COAPT, I think we can fill this box that in higher risk patients with secondary MR, the mitroclip in appropriate patients is going to be an important addition to the armamentarium. So that's kind of where we are. But I would also argue that mitroclip and severe FMR therapy really means you've got to hit a sweet spot. You've got to have severe enough MR. You've got to have the appropriate dynamics from the standpoint of LV size and function. You've got to have patients that have the appropriate clinical scenario, and you've got to have a good candidate for mitroclip anatomically and an experienced operator. And I can't emphasize that enough. And many new concepts being developed. I really love some of the new work being done by Paul Grayburn and others looking at um, how we look at both the ventricle and the severity of the MR to decide which patients may be better candidates for something like mitroclip. But it's a complex, multi-layered matrix. Again, appropriate anatomic factors, operator skill and experience, symptoms and optimal medical therapy in these patients. So I think it's not everyone who's going to be getting mitroclip for FMR. So what does the future look like? Uh, as Steve and others have said, the mitral valve is extraordinarily complex. It's like a deck of cards. Um, many of the structures affect other structures. As you um, tinker with one, you affect the other, and many patients have multiple layers of disease in the mitral valve apparatus. And right now, in 2019, at last count, we had 67 mitral valve devices that have been um, uh, proposed uh, and been in animals or in humans. That's an extraordinary number, and it's almost beyond understanding as to where we go from here. So what I'll do is I'll give you eight quick predictions in the eight minutes I have. I will say I'm really impressed with the success of MitroClip and Co-op. I think it's going to force, as much as anything else, an awareness revolution which should bring more patient candidates into the MR transcatheter treatment pool. This is what Maurice was talking about. This under-treatment has to stop, and I think if we can demonstrate that we can affect things such as mortality, that's gonna change the way people think. It also means that we're not communicating well enough with our heart failure community, and we haven't really accepted guideline-directed medical therapy, which in heart failure and reduced EF occurs in less than 5% of patients. So all of these things have to change in parallel, and I think the mitroclip will also play an important role as a control therapy in future FMR studies. I mentioned this in an earlier talk today. We have so many exciting pharmacologic therapies in the treatment of heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. When you layer on the mitroclip through the COAP trial, this really should be uh, a class one recommendation just based upon its effect on mortality during the first two years after therapy. So this should improve awareness. More patients should enter the treatment pool. I hope that we can overcome some of the frustration that, that Maurice expressed and get beyond the sliver of patients that we're currently treating with mitroclip. I think that we need to amplify the COAPT effect by expanding the treatment population of primary and secondary MR anatomic subgroups um, and clinical variables. That means more clinical trials. And also, there's a flood of new devices that relate to leaflet approximation or gathering that you are going to see over the next several years, the first of which is the so-called Pascal device. So you're going to see mitroclip being used in lower risk patients in different anatomic scenarios as operators get better and the technology improves. This is a given. And all for the purpose of, and it's what Paul said, really, sometimes you can't predict the, the magnitude of MR reduction. And we know if you leave residual MR behind, you're not going to have the clinical impact that was shown in the COAP trial. So we need to be certain that we're gonna reduce the MR as aggressively as we can with some of these new leaflet approximation techniques. And just an image of the Pascal, which is already in clinical trials in the US. Third prediction, 
Um, certainly, there's going to be continued development of transcatheter mitral valve annular reduction devices, largely for secondary MR. We need to try to replicate, maybe even surpass some of the surgical predicate therapies because surgical predicate therapy with mitral annuloplasty devices has been associated in many clinical trials and clinical practice with significant recurrence. These devices need to be user-friendly. They need to be better than they are right now. Um, they've got to have safe and effective short and long-term MR reduction. This is a tall order. We've got to overcome some of the current technical challenges, including anchor location placement and dislodgement. Not going to be trivial. So these annuloplasty devices, I think, are important to develop, but they're not there yet. An easier version of an annuloplasty device is the indirect Carillon annuloplasty device. It's, it's an, an internal jugular placement. The procedure takes 20 to 30 minutes. D doesn't affect all patients, but in an interesting sham-controlled, randomized trial, the reduced FMR trial, <clears throat> in a relatively small number of patients, there clearly is a reduction in MR, and there was some early clinical benefits. This is now in an important FDA study, and it's a fascinating trial. Um, that would allow uh, treatment of the Carillon device in um, uh, secondary mitral regurgitation with the expectation of even adding a mitra clip as an add-on in those patients that are not um, um, successfully treated. Um, and this is a sham control randomized trial. Now, there are other exciting annuloplasty devices. You've heard about Millipede. Millipede is fascinating from the standpoint of placement, anchoring, and actuation. To me, the most exciting part now is the fact that we've finally integrated an imaging system into the device. So there's an ice catheter in the center of this device, which allows you to better direct where the anchor placements are going to be and to be able to selectively do actuation regionally to get an optimal effect. So this is a fascinating new device. Uh, it's gone through early feasibility studies. Uh, it has not entered the US clinical market yet. You can see the quality of the ice images and the anchor shown in these two slides. Very, very impressive. So I would say that if this device can really fulfill its expectations, that it certainly can bring annuloplasty, which this is beating heart, real time annuloplasty, to a different stage than what we've currently seen. Next, what about cordial suspension devices? We haven't really talked about those. You know, Steve did an elegant job talking about that mitral valve repair cures patients with the right surgeon. The problem is there aren't enough right surgeons. Uh, and the referral practice of uh, mitral valve repair is very, very selective, highly competitive, and many of the patients aren't getting treated for technical reasons in terms of surgical um, uh, expertise. So it's important to address these limitations and to have an alternative that is transcatheter-based. Um, I think it will preserve options for other future therapies. Ultimately, it needs to be transeptal access for safety um, and also for operator efficiency reasons. So the current device that is in clinical trials is the Neocord. A transeptal version of this is aggressively under development. And another device of this genre called Pipeline is a a uh, transeptal version of a cordial suspension therapy that should importantly impact our ability to successfully treat with a sole device patients who have primary mitral regurgitation um, and to expand what the surgeons are currently able to do by allowing more operators to be able to treat patients with primary MR. Of course, you've seen um, some discussions about TMVR. There is a relentless evolution to make this into a safe and effective procedure. There's strong competition now with repair therapies. Paul is right. These discussions are not so easy. The advantage, of course, is the predictable and complete elimination of MR, irrespective of, of etiology. The disadvantages are screen failures, early complications, multiple technical challenges. Um, it should also uh, provide an advantage by hopefully replacing the need for surgical TMVR in many patients by, ha by having a transcatheter beating heart alternative. So there is a lot of competition right now. The advantage here is that you're really not um, uh, dependent upon a single mitral valve apparatus target because you're treating multiple sites. It's less invasive, can be predictable from the standpoint of durable elimination of MR. And if we can overcome the technical challenges, I think it's going to be fairly generalizable. And it may open up the, treat, uh, the potential patient candidates beyond what we're currently doing with things like 
Um, Mitra clip, you saw the interesting work being done with MAC, rheumatic heart disease, many other situations where the anatomic limitations make things like mitra clip difficult. A partial landscape, and already, as you can see here, six devices that have transeptal versions that are in clinical practice. Some of the newer ones are Sophia and CardioValve. And the Apollo trial um, uh, is, is among the two FDA randomized trials which are looking at TMVR in um, a, a population of patients with either primary or secondary MR, um, you know, hopefully being the, the earliest version of an approval study. This is with the Intrepid device. We've heard a lot about imaging, and I certainly agree. I think that imaging needs to develop and will. Uh, the new 3D ice catheters are fascinating. A facilitated multimodality co-registration you've just seen. Uh, this is going to extend to routine adaptive bioprinting models and to something called interactive medical holography. We are hopeful that a Columbia will have the first system in the United States of a real-time interactive holographic imaging system um, that was developed in Israel. The first system has been in Toronto for the past year that allows you to physically inter uh, uh, to interact with an image which is not on a flat screen. This is what the device looks like, the holoscope. And that's me with my finger interacting with an image which is standing in front of me uh, and will completely transform the way we do quantitative assessments and hopefully guide procedures in some of these complex structural domains, including mitral valve disease. At the same time, we need a new breed of specialized AV valve therapists. Uh, they have to have the same skill sets as our cardiac surgeons in terms of understanding cardiac imaging. And they've got to have very versatile and advanced skills in transcatheter therapies. So this is going to be a dedicated subspecialty. Not every TAVR operator is going to be a, a mitral and tricuspid valve operator because the experiences required are diverse, the creativity is necessary, and it's going to be a smaller pool of operators. And finally, I would expect and beware at times, but be open to the possibility of some out-of-the-box and novel concepts for transcatheter MR therapy. So true innovation is, it really has been vibrant in this space, um, and I expect that that will continue. You've heard one, you know, it's fascinating. Ancora was originally called Guided Delivery Systems, was developed for a different purpose more than 10 years ago. This has evolved over a decade into a device that is a subannular implant, not just for MR, but mainly for heart failure and, re and reduced ejection fraction by inducing a basal ventriculoplasty effect that affects LV volumes and dimensions, wall tension stress, reduces MR. It's a fascinating new technique that is being developed uh, and that I think has the potential to have an important impact, not just on MR, but also heart failure and, re and reduced ejection fraction. Just some images, and Scott showed you a case. This is another case that's been done. Just getting into this, we're in an early feasibility study that I predict within a year could evolve into a pivotal clinical trial. And how about this, the 4CTMVR Alta Valve technology. This is a left atrial placement of a superannular open nitinol frame, which is ball-shaped, containing a tri-leaflet biologic valve, which is pivoted in the other direction like a, um, uh, like a chimney with atraumatic fixation and transeptal introduction. It's been done in animals. Um, uh, a handful of humans have been done, entering an early feasibility trial, studies done in Canada, uh, study in Japan. Uh, this is completely outrageous, and who knows? Maybe this is going to have um, more application in the treatment of MR than we think. Truly out-of-the-box thinking. So I showed this earlier. I think that uh, we're at a, you know, a very interesting time. I'm not sure if transcatheter mitral valve therapies will be as successful as TAVR has been. It's certainly going to take much longer. It's going to blend multiple device strategies, so it's not going to be one. And it certainly also is going to be integrated with good medical therapy and surgical treatment. Thank you.